Thank you and good afternoon. This brown shriveled thing, it's an apple. It is a, a sad looking apple, but it's still an apple. And uh, here we have a grapevine. Uh, it's seen better days for sure. Here is a potato. Certainly not the type that you'd want to uh, bake and eat, I'm sure. This is a banana tree and it's on its last leg. The thing that these plants have in common is that they are ill. And this is a problem for us because a threat to plant life is a very real threat to human life. When a plant becomes ill, its functions are impaired, much like a human's. Except instead of a, a rash or a fever, its roots might not be able to sufficiently draw water from the ground, or its leaves might wilt and brown, unable to synthesize the chlorophyll needed to sustain its life. Now, the culprit might be an insect, or a fungus, or a bacterium. But regardless, if the disease is severe enough, the plant will die. And this can be devastating, because stress on plant populations can spell disaster for human ones. Now, a caveat, I am not a biologist, I'm not a scientist, or a botanist, but I am a food historian by training, and I'd like to share a number of historical examples of the types of ecological consequences brought on by plant disease, what we may call blight, and uh, see what we might learn from them. So let's begin here in New Jersey with the gypsy moth. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this insect in its larva form. Here we are, a, a fuzzy caterpillar with a voracious appetite for leaves. Now, the gypsy moth was introduced accidentally to the United States in the 1860s. Within about a decade, outbreaks began, and the federal and state governments were quick to recognize that it was a problem. It began around Boston and spread quickly, and despite the efforts of the government, it wasn't possible to eradicate. And the current range is uh, the entire northeast of America. In 1981, 13 million acres of forest, including many orchards, were defoliated, devastated. What does 13 million acres look like? It's the area highlighted in red. Absolutely remarkable. Another example, bananas. This is the banana that you're probably all familiar with. It's a variety that we all eat. It's called Cavendish. Now, our grandparents and great-grandparents wouldn't have been familiar with this. They were more accustomed to enjoying a variety that looked similar, but some say tasted a lot better, called Gros Michel. What happened? Why aren't we eating the same bananas that our grandparents and great-grandparents uh, had? Well, in the 1950s, a blight called Panama disease, a fungus, uh, struck in Central America and growers and exporters of bananas sought to find a solution. So they replaced Gros Michel with Cavendish. However, this was uh, not the best idea. It was like putting a, a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, a temporary solution, because nowadays a new strain of Panama disease is attacking Cavendish, such that our children or grandchildren might not know it. This unassuming little bug by the common name Phylloxera, almost eradicated a plant called Vitis vinifera. Now, you might not be familiar with its scientific name, but I assure you most of you know its common parlance. It is the grapevine responsible for the world's fine wines, the Cabernets, the Merlots, the Chardonnays. When this bug infested European vineyards in the late 19th century, French wine production in a period of 20 years declined by 73%. Now imagine that, a world without wine. Stop. <laughs> Don't imagine that. 
joking aside, even if you aren't a fan of trees, you don't like bananas, and you don't drink wine, let me provide one last uh, example that might open you up to the fact that uh, blight has a really uh, true uh, impact on humans. 1845 to 1852, the Great Famine of Ireland decimates the population. The proximate cause is a water mold that destroys and kills potato plants. One million people died. One million people emigrated. The remarkable fact is that the population of Ireland today is still lower than it was in 1840. So, how did we get here? What happened? Well, relative to geological time, that is the history of the planet Earth, disease and plants were in relative ecological equilibrium. And the fact is that uh, it wasn't so much a problem. However, in the last 500 years, something changed. What was it? What tipped the balance of the scales in favor of disease that made it spread more quickly and with greater intensity? Well, it's us, humans, uh, homo sapiens. We are uh, a problem in a way, and uh, we're not all that great for plants. Uh, allow me to explain. Three particular human-triggered events really set the stage for the prevalence of blight to uh, get worse. First, Columbus discovered America. Oh, he's not having a good day. <laughs> in connecting continents, in uh, bringing together North and South America with Europe, and Africa and Asia, he effectively shrunk the world. The planet became a smaller place. Next, the 19th and 20th centuries saw a flurry of innovations which sped up the speed of travel. Technology essentially collapsed time. And third, even though humans have uh, been uh, agricultural beings for approximately 12,000 years. It really wasn't until the last hundred or so which we perfected uh, the art of efficient agriculture. However, this had its cost and reduced biodiversity. Now, let me explain a little further. Here we have Columbus, and in making the world a smaller place, he brought in contact numbers of species that hadn't necessarily co-evolved. Plants and animals that had been separated for millennia had all of a sudden come in contact with one another and uh, hadn't necessarily uh, gained immunity or resistance to invasive or foreign species. Further, the advent of the steam engine in uh, the 19th century, followed by the combustion engine, collapsed time. Now, in 1620, it took the Mayflower approximately more than two months to cross the Atlantic, to go from Plymouth, England to Cape Cod. By the 1850s, the steamship, the average tra transatlantic voyage, took about two weeks. Time served as a natural barrier to the spread of foreign biological matter. The rise of blight in the form of potato blight or wine blight came about because people moved more quickly. Whether we want to or not, when we travel, we bring luggage with us, intended or otherwise. The 19th century saw this natural firewall demolished. Now, we get to modern agriculture, a true phenomena. However, modern agriculture has reduced biodiversity by dedicating more land to fewer species. In the drive to grow some plants better, we ultimately grow fewer plants. Now, the efficiency of modern agriculture is truly astounding. Between 1920 and 1950, global agricultural output doubled. Again, between 1950 
1965, and yet again, it doubled between 1965 and 1975. But it had cost. More land had to be dedicated to growing fewer species. Monoculture was increased. And selective breeding meant again that we grew fewer species of plants. With fewer species available, the likelihood that disease would spread amongst the species that remained was greater. So then, what do we do if we recognize there's a problem and the problem is us? From a plant's perspective, we are the weedy species. We are unwanted and we are uh, destructive. So what actions can we take to undo or prevent some of the harm we've done as a species to plants? Well, first, we can follow the rules. Now, if today is the first time that this problem has been made explicit to you, rest assured, people have been aware of it for quite some time and we're working on it. The United Nations in 1951 passed the International Plant Protection Convention uh, precisely to give governments guidelines to allow for quarantines and restrictions. There are rules now that govern the transportation of biological matter. So I urge that when you go on vacation to obey quarantine restrictions, the pieces of paper you receive on airplanes that you no normally toss out, actually read them. Second, we can celebrate biodiversity. Now, how can we do this? We can simply shop differently, not necessarily for different foods, but different types of plants. Today, more than 90% of our caloric intake and protein comes from an astonishingly small amount of species, just 15 different types of plants and eight types of animals. Wheat, rice, and corn account for more than 50% of global plant caloric intake. That is incredible. We need to do better for ourselves and for plants. So next time you go shopping, try some, something new. Uh, buy an heirloom variety of a favorite food. Go to the farmer's market. Try different food. Avoid buying generically named fruits or vegetables, as these tend to be the ones propagated on industrial farms. Finally, we need to work with nature. The past is instructive. Though we have fungicides and pesticides galore, if we open our eyes and our minds, the solution can sometimes be right in front of us. The past is instructive. If we look to the wine blight of the late 19th century, how was the scourge of phylloxera defeated? Quite simply, botanists discovered that if you connected the top of a vulnerable European vine like Merlot to a hardy, resistant rootstock from America, the problem would be solved. And wine, indeed, was saved by this simple and elegant solution to a terrifying and worrisome problem, no wine. So, again, I urge you to follow the rules, celebrate biodiversity, and work with nature these are good ideas for people, but more, they're great ideas for plants. Thank you.